there are people right now in power positions that are actively creating cultures of fear and violence and ignorance and separation. And part of why I think art is still absolutely an invaluable form of activism is because it creates culture in the face of that so that that's not the only culture that's present. We have to keep creating culture. Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. This week's guest is Lydia Violet Haratunian, a delightful human being, a violinist, a deep ecologist, a student of Joanna Macy's and the work that reconnects. And so she's a great person to talk to about how to deal with, how to process, integrate, and then celebrate some of the most difficult stuff that we're going through together as a planet. While I was re-listening to this episode, as I edited, I was reminded of episode 74 with Terry Patton and his book, A New Republic of the Heart, and how much heart shines through in this particular interview how much care and attention Lydia gives to her responses, and how obvious it is that when she speaks her truths, it comes from a place of deep, committed, embodied practice. She also gives one of the best answers I've ever heard to the typical end of episode question about what kind of communication you'd like to make to those unborn future generations who are, in some wider sense, already listening. If you intuitively know, but have struggled to articulate the vital importance of music and art and community in the collective process of trauma, crisis, grief, and the kind of coming together required for us to move coherently through the turbulence of our times and into a deeper, collective articulation of our place and purpose in the cosmos, then Lydia does a great job in this episode of helping find words to explain how music is a medicine, why music matters, and why whether you consider yourself musical or not, it is a vital task for each of us to claim our voice. But first, I just want to give a quick shout out to the 122 Patreon supporters, including new supporters Katie Teague and Schmoo. Thank you all so much for helping keep this show afloat. It's a lot of work to do this whole show by myself, and that will change as soon as I can. I have a lot of people I would like to weave into this and support their talent and their contributions to the show. But to level this up from being a bedroom operation to a community enterprise, a wide and thriving conversation, this takes your support and every one of you who has shared this show with a friend, rated and reviewed it on iTunes, shared these episodes on social media. I thank you all. It makes a difference. And slowly but surely, this program has grown into one of my favorite potted plants, something that I look forward to nourishing and cultivating with you for a long, long time to come. So everybody that's been helping out, again, thank you so much. If you would like oodles of exclusive content, head on over to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. And there's a ton of free public stuff there also that anyone interested in this show, I think, will love. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce you to the mind and heart of Lydia Violet. Enjoy. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. (laughs) 
I think we should just pick up right where we we where we were before we started recording, which is talking about how uh, you're you're talking about being monogamous in San Francisco and how it's like uh, it's it's almost it's like a form of bondage. Unique. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's it's like the outlying romantic like quality or something. I mean, I think mostly because of like the folks I hang out with. Like, I like to hang out with folks that question things and you know look at boundaries in a questioning way and look at what we how we're told to do things by authority. You know, through questioning them. And so there is like there's a lot of still like a lot of. Uh, relationship exploring in the Bay Area and I think that there are people who are who have found the way that they like to love and it is more than one person and they do it well and they do it with respect and they do it with communication and yeah I tried it and did get to this place where I was like whoa I didn't know what I was I guess and now I know that I, at least for now, I'm the unicorn who likes monogamy. Whoa. Have you, have you read the, uh, the sex 3.0 wiki? No. I, I feel like they, they offer a really useful distinction. Um, they talk about there being sort of three ages of human sexuality, the pre-modern, modern, and post, you know, or like pre and sure. pre agrarian and then like post modern sort of, so you get like hunter gatherer, uh, like tribal identity, group sex, kind of mushroom on the full moon stuff. And then we uh-huh. settle down and we start, you know, domesticating our cattle and tracing paternity and becoming preoccupied with property and, and stuff. And so that's where the, the monogamy and like, you know, you own your wife and kids stuff. But then they suggest right. that the network technologies are pushing us out and into this sort of um, post normal space they use this term swing. They say that it's, it's like, it's not as simple as monogamy or, or, or polyamory that there is fenced and unfenced, which can be a relationship or a person. So you can be like a, a poly person, like an unfenced person in a fenced relationship. And then, or you can be, you're like many, I think many people experimenting in this area are, actually a like a fenced monogamous person in an unfenced relationship but then they talk about a third category which is swing and they say most people are actually swing which is when they're in a partnership they're one way but when they're single they're a different way that's how i feel yeah i would i would relate to that and i think that it's absolutely understandable that if we've lived in this highly in the western world because I don't know about every other culture, and I think a lot of places have been different or similar. But if we've lived under patriarchy for 2,000 years, and there has been a very strong, strict definition of sexuality for however long, then of course it would make sense for there to be a liberation of that in a time where you're free to question things again. What seems to me, just about humans in general, is that in so many categories, we're just pretty diverse as like a species. And if someone has freedom and safety to just find their find their sexuality, the form of their sexuality that they enjoy, and for it to be able to change. And, you know, what human beings need to feel fulfilled and held in a relationship that doesn't seem to change that much but maybe what someone desires and what works for them you know as far as a structure does change from person to person so I'm glad that I do live in a community where people are learning to relate in a way where they do feel comfortable enough to not just accept what authority has told them how they're supposed to love or engage in sexuality and that means that I was free to explore, and I did. And now, at least at my 35-year-old self, has come on the other side being like, I'm so stoked for monogamy! Oh, <laughs> man! I'm, like, really excited about it. I'm super excited about it, you know? And I'm glad other people are doing what they're doing. So I appreciate the diversity in the ecosystem of human sexuality, you know? Yeah. I don't want anyone to tell anyone 
what they should or shouldn't be doing, you know, within reason, within reason. <laughs> so there's, I feel like <laughs> the reason that we're actually on this call is to talk about your, your music. And so I want to, I want to, I want to try and build a, a bridge of metaphor from here to there, um, which I think starts with the fingerboard of the fiddle. Because I'm a guitarist and I, I play a fretted instrument. You might call right. it a fenced instrument, you know, right. and you're, you're sort of like stuck within one system of tuning and intonation. And, and uh, whereas the violin has, has become this epic invasive species world around that, <laughs> that is able to automatically integrate with so many different musical styles precisely because it has no frets. It's music system polyamorous. And there's something about, um, you know, the, the way that, like, if you regard the uh, sort of sexual, human sexuality and human creativity, the voice, uh, musical expression as, uh, like, mirrors of each other across the axis of, of the esoteric body, you know, that there, you've got sort of your, like, lower creative center and your higher creative center in the throat, Um so I feel like I feel like uh, in in a lot of ways your work is about helping people uh, connect to or modeling for people how to connect to that exploratory and experimental creativity like find find your own voice find your own expressivity and I'd I'd love to hear uh, how you came into that and where it's taken you and all that. I love that this is the first time I've ever heard anyone refer to the violin as musical polyamory. (laughs) But I'm definitely going to think about that because it made me think about how when I first realized I could improvise, which I played my entire childhood training in classical, and I never knew that I could even improvise until I was 24. And then once I discovered that I could improvise, I wanted to play with so many different people and different I realized I could play outside the style of classical music and I didn't know that even though I had listened to so many different kinds of music so in a way it was true I could take this instrument my violin and all of a sudden I was playing with like rock and roll blues music gypsy jazz um you know so many different hip-hop so many different kinds of music and I think my soul helped me be adaptable to that. You know, my like spirit of adventure made me curious about it. And then I do think it was my classical background probably that helped me get into that. Um, But anyway, so that's kind of an interesting, I like your metaphorical shift there. (laughs) That's good. Um, You got to pull them out of my ass every once in a while, you know? Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. How far can you leap? (laughs) Um, I like when I think about my work, you know, what I do, which I can talk a little bit about, you know, I've been a musician my whole life, even though I never referred to myself as a musician until a couple years ago, which is interesting. I played music my whole life, but it was always just something like I started violin when I was three years old. So it's like my elbow, you know, it's like something that I just have always had that I can forget that I even have and do and when I was a kid playing music was never about what I was going to do when I was older it was just it was just part of life to do that it was natural like of course I'm going to take lessons and be an orchestra and be in choir and all those things but anyway so when I started studying with Joanna Macy and I was so drawn to what she was teaching about and acknowledging you know she was acknowledging the kind of insanity of what we're going through as a species and in different cultures on a daily basis. And she was speaking to both as individuals and communities, how can we metabolize our despair and our fear and our anger about that we might experience on a daily basis, whether we acknowledge it or not? Um, How can we metabolize that? And there's different reasons I think that I can talk to about like why that might be important. But first, the link to music is that I learned that body of work from her and I studied deep ecology with her. And I'm not a Buddhist scholar, but her Buddhist scholarship went into that work. So I studied kind of these different avenues into 
just talking to people about what was happening in the world and how they're doing with it. Um, one reason being when you're upset about something that's happening in the world, it's usually an indication that you give a damn mm. about what's happening. <laughs> and that's like pretty holy right now. That's to me, that's like a holy sentiment because how are we going to get through this unless we care about what's happening? And if somebody's pretty upset about children starving somewhere or a nuclear threat or the way the presidency is being handled or even just a store closing down in their neighborhood, rather than seeing that as, de- you know, oh, they're a depressing person or whatever it is, I see them as like, wow, they still care about what happens to people. That's rad. That's pretty awesome. And so obviously I got attracted to that work and also because I was experiencing that pain for a long time, but labeled as sensitive and depressed and all these things. And I met Joanna and it was validated as like, wait, I really care about what happens to people. I don't know how to relate to the homeless man on the street because it confuses me that he's on the street. And so that's where the cosmology comes in and being able to have a framework for orienting towards the beauty to be alive at all and that I woke up on a planet in crisis and here I am as a human being trying to figure out what do you want to be when you grow up you know it's like so with the music then I was already doing Joanna's work and three almost three years ago I decided to go to Envision Festival but I actually I didn't decide, decide to go to the festival I decided to go to Costa Rica and one of my best friends is a witch and an herbalist in, she, in Costa Rica. And she said, I'm slinging herbs at this festival. You want to come sling herbs? So I was like, of course. So I go to Envision to work. And I always have my violin with me. Anyway, needless to say, through a series of interactions and the right person, I guess, just hearing me play by the fire, I get invited up on the main stage to play first time on a festival and main stage and that leads to me starting to play with Ayla Nario on the Polish ambassador which also leads to me the next day meeting Rising Ap- Leah Song from Rising Appalachia and having the idea for doing Joanna's work that reconnects with music in the workshop as a, as a fundamental part of the workshop and a concert and we did it four months later with Rising Appalachia, we did the first one So I didn't really, I had like a vision, I guess, and then just followed it through. And then now have seen, oh, music is another fundamental way that we as people and as communities find our resiliency in hard times, the way we share our stories. And so many people either didn't get the chance to sing, you know, got shut down, whatever it was. And there's multiple beneficial things that happen when they are in an environment that encourages them to make music with other people, especially when talking about what's happening in the world and learning about like civil rights music and, you know, movement tradition music from all over the world. And so ever since then, I've just been putting the two together. And then I created my own band and music because I had never written a song before three years ago either. <laughs> and my, and Ayla and, you know, the women that I worked with from Mom Muse and Leah and Chloe from Rising Appalachia, they were like, so, like, where's your, where's your music? <laughs> All this music you're doing, where's your music? And so I was encouraged and then I now have my own band and get to travel and play and have, You know, my album that I made, you know, I never knew what it was like to make your own album. I'd played on tons of other people's albums, but you pick up an album and it's like, it's the story of your life. Every lyric is something that happened or a thought that you had, and you really don't realize that until you make it. So my album is an expression of me trying to grow up in the world and reconcile what's happening in the world and being inspired by rootsy traditions of American music and international music that 
to me feels like resiliency, like gospel music or blues music or Appalachian folk music or whatever it is. Mm. I think of all the times that, like, I didn't really, s- I'm the opposite of you, I guess, in some ways. Like, I, I didn't actually develop an interest in music and in, in the playing and the performance of music until I was in high school. And I learned on my on my own. I never had a formal education oh, cool. of any kind. And, you know, I kind of a wild animal, you know, as far as this stuff is concerned. And uh, with, you know, with all of the attendant hardship and confusion of, you know, lacking proper uh, mentorship and community. But nonetheless, I have this this thing now, this this part of me. And I find that, you know, singing has been so valuable in situations where I might otherwise have been drawn into despair or like singing kept me awake while I was driving at night or singing, you know, singing was a something that, you know, got me through a very, uh, you know, scary kind of fearful situation. And there's all these, you know, there's all these physiological reasons for that psychological reasons. Yeah. Right. But I wonder, you know, like when you're teaching music as medicine, when you're when you're hosting these workshops, when you're talking about this stuff, when you're sharing your stuff in more than a stage performance way, but in like a a way that empowers people, like mm-hmm. how do you how do you uh, bring this gift into people's lives in a culture that for so many people has alienated us from the process of creation and like creativity and personal expression. Like most people I know are terrified of singing, will not do it in front of anyone, like cannot, you know, cannot find that place where they're able to just comfortably express themselves in that way. Yeah. I think it's actually similar to the conversation we were having about sexuality earlier, where it's like everyone's in a different place. You know, like, for instance, if I'm with a new group of people and we're, you know, first we might start with breathing or we might, we might start with a song. I always say, you can just listen if you want. You can just hum with your mouth closed, hum along if that's where you want to start. You can belt it out if that's where you want to start. Like, just start wherever you are. It's totally fine. We're going to have music in this room. You know, either way, music will be present and it'll be present for a little while, depending upon how long this workshop is. And so I think I think it's important to not demand, especially with creativity and music, that when someone starts, it sounds everyone now everyone chime in in the exact same way. Um, Maybe we'll get there to have the like choir experience because I can tell you a lot of people do want to be in the choir but like you're saying there's so much there's this total separation of like the people who are musicians and the people who don't have it right and the people who don't have it are just supposed to listen and the people who like quote have it they're the music makers to entertain but then there's other cultures where it's like well everyone had it everyone had it and and Somebody might have the beat. Someone else might have the words. Someone else, you know, a choir of people have the notes. And so I think, I guess, where you start feels important to me. And then making sure that you're just creating, like, a kind environment. If there's someone there that is, like, pretty scared of singing, which there usually is. And then I can tell you, once that person starts singing you can't get them to stop singing and it's awesome. (laughs) Like, it's great. You know, they're the person that like halfway through, you're like, you guys want to learn this song or do this thing? They're like, learn the song. We want to learn the song, you know? And it makes people generally in my experience, it, it gives them a feeling of happiness to create beauty with other people, you know? And I, I guess I'm starting to be of the opinion that it's our birthright to make music everyone's everyone's birthright um i was really moved this last weekend i taught a workshop with joanna and there was a deaf person in the class 
And I had never facilitated music, you know, with someone who was deaf who was present. And I learned the way that she sings because she does sing. Mm. And it was um, important for all of us that she still be willing to share her voice, you know? Yeah. So I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious how this links into deep ecology and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, what you talked about, the, you know, processing this despair, um, the grief, you know, that we experience as we, you know, transition. And, uh, yeah, like, where did this, where, you know, you say, you know, you're not, you're not the, uh, coming from precisely the same sort of Buddhist deep ecology spot as Joanna Macy, but like, obviously that's deeply informed your work and you continue to work with her. And so I'd love to hear yeah. you speak to that. Yeah, like, it's true. I'm not a scholar of these things, but I've studied them through Joanna and through the lens of the work that reconnects and in understanding the perspectives that they offer well enough to be able to see them sometimes in the world and in my own life. And, you know, if deep ecology, as well as Buddhism, like with dependent co-arising and Prajnaparamita being the wisdom of the intricacy of all of life, how there is nothing that's separated from anything in the entire web. You know, that's deep ecology too. Deep ecology is looking at the larger organism of who we are. That I'm not Lydia walking on a, you know, on grass that is merely an accidental um, assortment of atoms that happen to bump into each other to become the grass, but that I am walking in a living ecosystem where the grass and the trees and I and the air and the water all have an intricately interwoven reason why they coexist with each other. And I think the way that that relates to our despair is that if I wasn't intricately related to that tree, I wouldn't care if it was cut down. But the pain in my heart that I might feel when I find out that that tree is cut down might be important information that's coming at me about who I am, who and what I am on planet Earth, beyond maybe what my culture told me. <laughs> what? Oh, that's just, yeah, that's, uh, that's an especially astute point, I think, there. We form this self through reflection, you know, through what is presented to us by the people around us. And, like, I think uh, mm -hmm. all too often we limit our self-concept to that which is reflected through or, like, by other people at eye level and, and, and ignore the reflections that we receive from the rest of the world, you know, about the, I feel like the great majority of our identity is, is actually sort of non-human or like the majority of what it means to be human isn't like exclusively human. And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to grow up in a culture that's very, very focused on the human and, with very strong opinions about it, what it means to be become a successful human. And if a successful human is a productive human, we all like to be productive, is a productive human that can work 50 weeks a year, 40 or more hours a week, and our productivity leads to money, which leads to being able to have security that we will survive. Feeling our despair that there is major crisis happening in the world that might be communicated to us by the more than human world doesn't exactly lead to that productivity. It actually leads us to stop and to question what's happening. So of course we would live in a culture that doesn't necessarily want, like want or prioritize you doing that, but there are cultures that do. And there were cultures before we got here that did. And um, 
I think you're right. I think it's important to question who the self is. And I guess in deep ecology, the self just expands so much. You don't lose your identity. The leaf is still the leaf. I mean, uniqueness is completely permeates this cosmos as I know it. And to me, that's freedom. That a leaf is unlike any other leaf on the tree. That's incredible. The pervasiveness of that uniqueness and that leaf is completely interconnected with the existence of that tree as well. With, I've, I've heard Joanna say this and I love it so much. She, she always says, there's nothing you can do that severs you from the body of earth. You're earth, whether you know it or not. Now, Either way, you're, what if, what if you know? <laughs> I launch myself? <laughs> I mean, how far do I have to No, There's still that umbilicus, right? It's still, if you were 10 million light years away and you had your eyes closed and you held your hand out and what you felt come back and land in your hand was another human hand, you would go, Oh my God, earth. You know, like, that's how you know you're home. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's, I guess, you know, there's this concept that does come from Mahayana Buddhism that I super dig. <laughs> and it, it has to do to me with, it has to do with um, a lot of what we've been talking about. And um, a lot of us are familiar with the archetype of the Bodhisattva which is the figure that helps to heal suffering in the world. And when they die, they're at the gates of nirvana, and they say, no, I actually want to go back to earth and continue to help with suffering. So Bodhisattva or the Shambhala warrior, you know, different traditions have so many different names. The intention of the Bodhisattva is called Bodhicitta. And Bodhicitta is both compassion, the ability to just be with suffering in the world, but it's also the impulse to do something about it. So naturally, when I found out about that, I was like, wait a second. Where is, what, what happened to that? What, do we have a word for it? I don't, like, what is that? And so I started to learn about bodhicitta as this kind of um, healing intelligence that can be activated within us in the face of suffering. That's how I understand it now. And in the same way that, I mean, we can think of it as just human to human, and I think most people do. But when I put on my deep ecology hat, you know, the same way if I have a cut on my arm, it sends pain signals to the healing intelligence in my body, which awaken and then send healing to repair that cut. If you are suffering... If you are a part of the earth that is cut, you send me pain signals. I feel them empathically. And then bodhicitta or maybe these healing intelligences are awakened. And then I listen and I see, is there anything that I can do to tend to this suffering? And to me, that's earth to earth as much as it's human to human. So that might be true between a human and a tree or a tree and another tree. And so that kind of led me to this question, which I have, and I don't have an answer. If bodhicitta is more than a human intelligence, and if it's actually an intelligence of self-organizing systems that helps kind of with the continuation of life because it helps create repair in mm. an ecosystem. Mm. Well, you know, I'm thinking of the mycelial network in the you know, underground in the wood and how this sort of, this so-called wood wide web shuttles nutrients from evergreens to deciduous trees in the winter. And then from the deciduous trees to the evergreens in the summer, that there is actually a, a uh, sort of a trans species reciprocal altruism occurring at the level of the forest where the, the entire forest is an individual and I think about this with when you're talking about, you know, our, our, you know, feeling the pain of ecocide, you know, to, to put it bluntly, 
I had Daniel Schmachtenberger on the show recently. Uh, he, he does. He's the Neurohacker Collective guy. Oh and, yeah. Yeah, and and he's he's got a really interesting angle on the economy and like sort of what it's going to take for us to start behaving as a single planetary agency. And right. what he said was that right now, what the sort of the nature of our suffering, the contemporaneous emphasis on our suffering is in that we are sensitive to all of these things that are going on all around the world. We're aware of the way that our, our decisions as consumers or as, you know, um, citizens or whatever are affecting all of these things everywhere, you know, and we're, we're turning on the, you know, we're not logged out of the internet anymore ever, you know, and, yeah. and we're constantly exposed to sense input from tragedies and crazy bullshit happening everywhere yeah all the time yeah and yet the the nerves running in work but the nerves running out don't like we don't have an action and that a lot of the we don't have a we don't have a clear way of knowing how to respond to this experience to this information and i'm i'm curious i mean clearly music fulfills or like provides some sort of function in this capacity, some way of like, we can't actually do anything about it except sing or something like there's a, you know, that there's, it's, it's helping us bridge the gap between what we know and what we can't control. I think that part of what has happened is that in the modern Western human and maybe beyond the Western bodhicitta has been wounded and that it has splintered itself into in the in the buddhist tradition bodhicitta is something you start practicing and strengthening from a young age it's a muscle within you that needs to be tended to and um blessed and strengthened and practiced and if you live in a culture that doesn't value it and if you live in a time where, like you're saying, the magnitude of the problems can render you feeling so powerless, then how can you feel anything but paralyzed when it comes to action? And I think that part of part of that comes from one of the shadow sides of modern Western capitalism, which is isolation. Of course, if you feel isolated in your connection to a culture or to to the story of what's happening in the world, you were felt completely powerless. If we grew up with the notion that I am radically, I'm empowered because I am interconnected with so many other beating, pulsing people in the world who are also working on behalf of healing the planet, and that's actually my identity or a big part of it, I might not feel so powerless to act. I think that music is fundamental because there's nothing that a human being says or does that isn't first seated in consciousness. And I think that music helps work in the realm of consciousness. I think that's part of why so many people and discussions and communities are talking about shifts in consciousness, shifts in consciousness is so important. It's because if we figure out a new way of tending the garden, how will that structure last unless we have had some kind of shift in our consciousness to, to sustain us, you know, through the ups and downs of what could happen with that garden? And I think that music has an intelligence on multiple levels that helps inform our consciousness. I also think that music helps heal bodhicitta just from my time in uh, like learning about this and working with different people. I think that tapping into our larger identity that is real, but like not on the daily news helps with that. I wouldn't say that I feel powerless as much of the time anymore because I have such a clear shift in my own consciousness about my connection of like this individual body to all the bodies trying to help heal the planet rather than powerlessness i would say that i sometimes seriously feel the uncertainty of our moment Mm. 
that like we really don't know no one can tell you that we're going to make it out of this no one can tell you that we're not going to make it out that is real and so then in that uncertainty i have to ask myself and i think we all have to ask ourselves okay so what do i want to do anyway yeah what do i want to do i want to sing i want to make beauty i want to learn how to like grow food i want to try and have good relationships i want to learn about the individual way lydia in my own little sector can help create some kind of a healing helpful presence in the world in knowing that i am completely interconnected with a destructive system and it's really hard to extricate myself from that and so having compassion for myself in that you know and some people want to go live in the top of the mountain i still want to live in berkeley i need the culture of what's here to be happy it's true you know i need to go down walk to berkeley bowl you know and see all run into all these people i love i need to live with the choir so i remember how to sing like i'm one of those people and but like i no i don't i don't i don't do what i do because I know that it's going to help I, because I know that everything's going to turn out okay. That's not why I decide to try and understand how to be a beneficial presence in the world. It's not because of certainty of outcome that I do that. I actually do that more because even because of uncertainty of outcome. You know, yeah, it's like and if everybody I, knew it was going to go well, then it, this is the game theory. Like, everybody would just probably pack up and go home, and then it wouldn't happen, right? Like, it's like everybody just assumes everyone else is going to do it. I mean, I think a lot of people assume that right now, that, like, other people are going to, you know... I think there's a few different reasons why we see so much paralysis and apathy. But, like, ever since our current president got elected... I have never seen or had so many friends who weren't, quote, involved, you know, in the movement before that call me or write to me and go, what can I do? Like, I can't, I can't, like, sit like this anymore. Like, I need to do something. I mean, it's such a, isn't it a, it's so, it's such an interesting part of what crisis can elicit is, like, our best humanity. I don't want to say it's needed because I think that's a privileged perspective, Mm. And I think it's important to make sure that we are questioning the places from which we talk about suffering, you know, and the, the levels of privilege from which we talk about it. And I will say that, yes, you can observe that sometimes crisis can stimulate growth and transformation in human community. It can also be very traumatic and a lot of people suffer. And I don't want to be like, so that's all fine in service of the great transformation of consciousness, you know. It's just kind of all happening at the same time, I think. So bodhisattvas improvise. Yeah. Yeah, they do, I guess. Yeah, yeah, because you have to get really good at listening to your environment if you want to understand how to be helpful. There's the, uh, have you read James P. Carr's uh, Finite and Infinite Games? He talks about, no. he talks about this. He doesn't, he doesn't use the language of Buddhism, but he talks about the difference between seeing things as a, as a closed time bound game with, you know, clear rules as to who will win and lose. And then there's, you know, at some point you, there's a winner and there's a loser and then, you know, the game, yeah. the game like basketball or whatever continues, but each game only lasts a little while. And he's like, well, actually culture, we think of society as, as that it's like, it's, it's preoccupied with sort of maintaining its certain boundaries, but culture is this endlessly inventive human enterprise that's focused on not maintaining the past, but constantly reinterpreting it in a new way that makes it relevant to a changing world and mm. yeah and i think about like as things become 
more and more turbulent. I mean, obviously this can't go on until infinity, you know, but like we are going through this transition and it's like, it's not clear that we're anywhere near the end of it getting crazier. Right. Right. And it's so like, it seems like for the foreseeable future that this ability to play an open ended, creative, spontaneous, provisional game, it's being selected for as like a, as a cultural right. skill. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You take 15 years of violin lesson, you practice all the scales so that you can improvise or at least in theory. And so it, I think maybe it's the same thing with like spiritual lessons or lessons in kind of the muscle of being a wiser human being or able to be good to people in relationship or whatever it is. Maybe there's kind of the general intelligences that we try and learn well so that in the face of constant change, we can try and be relevantly adaptable. Like we stay adaptable, but also relevant in some way would seem important, you know? And I do think that you're right. I think that we don't know as far as when it comes to when like climax goes, as far as species crisis, eco crisis, cultural crisis, we don't necessarily know where we are. What I do know in, in reference to culture is that there are people right now in power positions that are actively creating cultures of fear and violence and ignorance and separation. And part of why I think art is still absolutely an invaluable form of activism is because it creates culture in the face of that so that that's not the only culture that's present. We have to. We have to keep creating culture which is a combination of many different things and music and art and story and spirituality and how you grow food you know and how you teach your kids that's all part of that and that's why an individual's passion about painting is actually important right now And I think that that's important to say because it's so easy to question that what you're doing has any value at all um, when you see the magnitude of the crisis. And I do think it's important to ask ourselves, is what I'm doing relevant and is it valuable in some way? But I don't think it's right or even though it might be common to say like, oh, well, what does music do? It doesn't do anything. What is it doing to help, you know, make sure that, you know, the, the oceans don't rise? I don't know, but I know that talking to people definitely isn't the only way that changes people's actions to be able to live in a better way with the planet. And I know that some of that happens through music. It's the consciousness change we were talking about. Yeah, there's, in the years that I've been contemplating this, and it's very obvious, actually, in, in that last presidential election that, that t- in the same way that most of our human identity is actually sort of subterranean or like below, sort of below the concrete, to, to use a uh, an <laughs> Polish ambassador, Elenario, kind of <laughs> pushing up the pavement, you know, kind of, is right? that, yeah. that most of our identity <laughs> is actually beneath this like veneer of control and, and like you know civil participation and so that there is there's this sense that we're not actually getting anywhere trying to have conversations with the opponent in whatever sense uh the other side of the the people on sitting on the other side of the fence quote unquote uh that are about the facts because you're 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 coming up against the boundary between two totally different ways of constructing the world. Right. But, and then like, and, and we're getting frustrated in that way, but there's all of these other ways that are in, in involved in the body's response to rhythm. The, like the earlier parts of the, 
our, our brain and our mind and the way that they respond to metaphor and to narrative in the lyrics of music. There's like mm. all of these things that sneak in sort of underneath the, the door of a rational conversation about this stuff. And like, you know, you may not be able to get people to agree on the data surrounding climate change, but you can compel people on both sides of the political divide to unite uh, in the feeling of something, you know, or the, or the story of, of it. The hurricane in Houston. Yeah. That was devastating for everybody that it affected. And it, it didn't have political exclusion to it. It didn't um, choose who it hit or didn't hit because of ideology, right? That is a deeply human experience that a big group of people went through. And it's interesting what you're saying about the level on which like rhythm or metaphor like can... Uh, in like affect human consciousness and I'd like to actually maybe like look more into that after this like that's mm -hmm. a new way of hearing that that I'm digging right now that I haven't really heard quite in that way um, and I guess for me again as with earlier with our sexuality conversation my response to to what you said is diversity keeps the ecosystem resilient there are some people who are very good at speaking with people who disagree with them. And there are other people that have a knack for communicating to a diverse group of people through music. It seems that there are so many different kinds of humans with different worldviews that all the ways are needed right now. Needed and valuable and important. You know, and yes, I do. I have had the experience. There is this artist named Reverend Seku that I toured for a while, two years ago. And his his name is Oseg Fayu Seku. And he has been a reverend activist for, you know, 25 years. Um, and after two years of being uh, frontline during the Black Lives Matter movement, he met up with uh, bass player J. Murray Hill. And they in one week wrote an album from kind of their burnout, their activist burnout and started a group that was Reverend Seku and the Holy Ghost. And it was gospel, blues, big band goodness. I mean, it was such good music. And I went on, I was lucky enough to go on tour with them a couple times. And um, I remember the first show of the first tour was at Susquehanna University in Pennsylvania, in pretty rural Pennsylvania. And here I was showing up with a group that was led by these wonderful Black Lives Matter activists and, you know, like the pretty diverse range of cultures in the band. And we're going to Susquehanna and we learn that, I think it was the week previous, someone had um, spray painted swastikas all over the campus. And um, needless to say, with my, like, Armenian genocide background, <laughs> you know, I was a little nervous. I was a little scared. But we got there as a group, and luckily, Reverend Seku is a reverend. <laughs> so he was like, look, like, hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Everything is going to be all right. And he kind of, you know, helped us, helped me come back a little more. And I can tell you, we went and we performed and the audience was a mix of black and white. And <clears throat> those were the two main demographics I saw. And then beyond that, and by the third song, they were up on their feet hooting and hollering and being like, oh my God, you know, so the music was good. And what we were singing were like, I got my hands up, so don't shoot, you know, mm. or like, I can't breathe. I mean, things that I think if someone was sitting there saying them in a lecture would be controversial. 
instantly, but we were singing them. And for some reason that changed the conversation, the, the tone of the conversation in a way that I am positive, not only allowed for more creativity in the minds of the people listening to the music, but led to some healing for all of us by the end of that concert. So that's why I say like all the ways. Some people want to go to a lecture. Some people want to go to a badass gospel blues concert. You know, I mean, that's where I want to be. <laughs> I like lectures too, though. I mean, I went to grad school. I love school so much. Um, and I, I guess maybe I'm curious, especially with something like racism, which I think has come to the forefront of the cultural dialogue again. How do we heal racism as a community and what part does music have in that? I don't know. I'm still very much exploring it. Well, it's probably the best way you can, you can get to, to get white, <laughs> white people singing, you know, I got my hands up, don't shoot, I can't <laughs> breathe, you know. Yeah, I mean... I think it also, when you sing, you elicit emotion. And if some, it's harder for someone to have defenses up to how it felt to have to say, you're, you're killing me, like I can't breathe. To kill a mockingbird, right? Like there's something about fiction. And I think, you know, song falls into this also because it's not stating a case. It's not making an argument. It's simply presenting something. You know, and so it, it, it's not received right. critically in that way, necessarily. Right. You know, like if somebody's going to criticize your song, they're going to talk about your, you know, your prosody or, you know, the melodic line or whatever. They're not necessarily saying, well, actually, you're, you got your facts wrong on this one. Right. It's like, it's a song. And the mo most people, if like a super badass beat comes on, they're like, oh my God, what's that? You know, what is that? I mean, obviously, music has been a fundamental part of social movements for a long time. Because the civil rights movement was fronted, you know, generated by the black community, and the black community in the States had stayed more connected to the tradition of music and song as a community than some other communities. And so, of course, music became a fundamental part of that movement as well. And I think that, you know, I, I took a class two years ago from Yusei Barnwell, who was one of the founding members of Sweet Honey and the Rock. Do you know them? Her, not not, oh not my well God. enough to speak on oh. it, no. God. So it's a group that's been around for like 25, 30 years. And it's usually a rotating cast of five black women. And they sing, you know, a wide genre of, from African you know, diaspora songs, civil rights music, spirituals, kind of like black tradition music. And so I went to this class by Issei Barnwell, and I'll never forget her saying, how come y'all don't sing in the streets anymore? She was just like, I don't understand how you would be able to keep doing that without music. Like we sung in the streets because we had to, to keep going. And I don't, I don't, I don't actually know how you keep going without that. Privilege. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. The privilege of not having to sing, you know, right. you know you're free to sort of forget who we are. Right. Like being so comfortable that I know, like what a thing, what a backwards thing. And like, I'm not an expert on racial history or the language of racial dialogue. But when I look at some, not all, because like I've studied like some of the Southern folk tradition music, some of which was born out of the white community and a lot of which was born, in, born out of the coming together of the white and black community. And it's interesting to me that so many of the people that I meet who have been stifled in their voices with singing are from European ancestry and it'd be interesting to understand why and how that happened what does it have to do with like the religious backgrounds of European I don't know 
because there's a lot of European music. It's vast and gorgeous. I'm like desperately trying to tour in Scotland and Ireland because I love the music there and I love all the people I've ever met from those parts of the world, you know. And why do I meet so many Irish people of Irish ancestry here in the States that don't know any of the music from their ancestry? Well, that may be an American thing. I mean, that may be, you know, the people really forcefully dividing themselves. Yeah. You know, culturally in order to participate in the melting pot experiment, you know, that we're like the America, uh, like w- William Irwin Thompson wrote this book, uh, uh, the American replacement of nature when he was writing about America to Europe and saying like, you guys are, are understandably preoccupied with the conservation of your cultural inheritance. But here in America, we're just like, throwing it all into a giant gumbo and, and like intentionally going into debt on the past in order to create something new and that the, the emphasis here has always been on rediscovering ourselves that we've selected out of these these cultures all of the people who wanted to put the past behind them and drive into a new space and that, you know, maybe we we sort of like lost a piece of our soul in that process. I don't know. That's a, it's an interesting version of the story. I mean, <clears throat> the native people who were here are orphaned from their culture because their culture was m- massacred. And then the European folks that are here are orphaned from their culture, like for a different reason. I mean, it's interesting how in the states like many people and i was included in that like pretty orphaned from my own heritage you know i'm persian and armenian and i knew some of the basics of my own persian culture but i wasn't necessarily running around as a kid going i'm persian you know (laughs) i think i I was like no 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 i can i can adapt to this like quote american you know identity of the, the person to be in order to be like the accepted one or whatever. Um, but I'm hopeful that what part of what music has to offer us is what would it look like if we all knew a song from our heritage and could come into a room and teach them to each other? Mm. What would that be like? I would like that. I, and for us, maybe that would orphan us a little less. Maybe we could have a little more cultural inheritance and a little more of an idea of how to share it in a way that's not oppressive or apologetic you know maybe we'd feel more justifiably the heirs to one another's cultures sure you know i feel like yeah that's, that's a piece of it is like people this question around cultural appropriation the question around like oh i can't i can't have that that's yours you know and well and i would reframe the question mm-hmm. i think the question is in general what did my ancestors do in relationship to your ancestors and how can that inform how i relate to the things that i might know i borrow from your culture mm-hmm. so that's one version and then Absolutely. Cultural exchange has been like the foundation of creativity for a very long time, you know, very long time. Um, I don't have answers a lot of the time in the conversations around like appropriation and exchange. I just try and like listen a lot and understand what I consider like crossing the line and being like that. You probably didn't really need to do that, you know, (laughs) and then where there's like, God, that's a awesome amazing dance from that place and i wonder if my body would do that and i'd like to explore that with my body you know and it's interesting i was just my dad is visiting and i was talking to him earlier today we were talking about kind of like the actually i'm not going to go there because it's a pretty sticky conversation i was going to talk about like west coast transformational festival community and different <laughs> cultural things that have been there but i'm actually not going to venture into that right now <laughs> That's a, that is that is a rough place to start an hour into the call yeah 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 i think it's not 
um, because it's complicated and doesn't have a clear answer and is easy to make generalizations that I think aren't actually helpful. So I'm going to step back from that one. (laughs) Well, well, let's, you know, we're coming up on it here. So like maybe the best way to tie a bow on this, I, I like asking these questions of guests typically at the end of a call and saying like, you know, this whole show is, is based on the idea that there's more people studying, say, Babylon today than we're living in Babylon. You know, mm. and if that trend continues, then it's easy to suspect that everything we do now is done sort of in the light mm. of the future's attention to it. Mm. That we're being watched in some sense, mm. you know, that we're making an important gesture, you know, that, that the children are paying attention, you know. And so how do you act around the kids? You know, how do you make sure that, that you're mm-hmm. not, you know, unintentionally setting a bad example? Um, right. Or like giving them something that they have to like go to therapy for later or whatever. And so I guess like to make that explicit, what do you hope your life says to the future? And then like if you had a question for the future, then what would that question to those unborn generations be? That's such a great way of framing that. Like the kids are watching. And actually I realized that there were some things about the work that reconnects that I didn't even touch on, like the deep time work, knowing that this is like future fossils, you know? Mm -hmm. Because in the workshops, we literally do exercises where we put people in pairs and one person is a being from seven generations in the future and they're interviewing you as you are today and so there's this dialogue happening between yeah. someone <laughs> you gotta come you would love it sounds great um, yeah. maybe if we're at the same festival and i'm speaking i'll facilitate that exercise so that you can do it but um but there's the way we were talking about being orphaned as a culture like i think we're orphaned in time as well you know where our connection to ancestors and future beings has just been, we're just so cut off from that in such a big way. And I think it's so great that you asked that question because there is a really big value that's important in considering not just that future generations are going to exist, but that we're in dialogue with them in figuring out how to live right now. I guess, did you, was one, the first question was, what does, what is my life? Like offering. What do you hope to say with your life? Yeah, to those yeah. not unborn. Um. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I hope to say. I guess I just hope to say that, like, continuing to be fierce in our kindness with each other is important. Is very very important. You know, and like, if we, whatever the question is, if I am able to try and seat myself from a place where my values are attention and heartfulness, as well as an ability to understand something well with my mind, like as well as my heart, if something that I do in my life could make sure that that sticks around, you know, that that would be what I hope to leave as like a stamp, Mm. I guess. And beauty making being part of that. And that's where the music comes in. Yeah. Do you have a question? (laughs) And then my question, I was thinking about that. I do have a question. I mean, I probably have a lot of questions, but I think my question would be, what can you see now looking back that we couldn't see then because we were in it? What is that 2020 vision that's so common with the difference between when you're in something and when you're looking back on something? What, what is that? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Lydia. Where can people find you online? 
Yeah, my artist name is Lydia Violet, and so all all of my my albums and my videos they're under that name, Lydia Violet, and my website is LydiaFiddle.com. And there's a lot there. There's like my upcoming workshops and music and, you know, rad collaborations that I'm doing and people that I'm, you know, I started playing with Climbing Poetry last year, which is like one of my favorite things in my life right now. So, yeah, just like when I'll be playing with them. And, you know, of course, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Lydia Violet Music and all that. But website's a good place to start. Your dot com is actually a totally gorgeous website that that puts <laughs> mine to shame and, and makes me question everything about my life and career choices and so on. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for yeah. joining me today to talk. My pleasure. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Future Fossils is part of the MindPod Network along with Third Eye Drops, The Astral Hustle, Synchronicity Podcast, and an oodle of other fascinating programs, I encourage you to go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. And stay tuned, because we have some awesome episodes coming up on Future Fossils. But for now, may your now be long and wonderful.